the first half is going to actually be almost delivering a lesson and showing you what a lesson would look like. The second part is we're going to hear from probably the most important people in the room, which are two students. We're going to hear from Marina, who I teach at Seven Oaks School, and Victoria, who came on the CBM course, and, they're going to look, and we're going to look at some of the things which they did, because I think one of the real messages is that the important thing is student output. So this is, this is an idea of what a lesson could look like. So let's start with something concrete. Okay? We're here in this conference, okay? and most of us are feeling quite well, but somewhere over here is this grisly ill person. Have we got any ill people in the audience? Okay, so there's an, Ill, there's an ill person at the back, okay? So can anyone explain what's going to happen because of this horrible person who's, who's in the room? Okay, so who, who did anyone speak to Conrad in the first coffee break? Okay, what's going to happen to those people who've put their hand up? Some of them are going to get sick, okay? And did anybody speak to those people? Yeah, and what's going to happen to those... What's going to happen to those people? Some of them are going to get sick. So we're going to get a disease spreading through a population. Okay, so first of all, let's try and model this. What factors and what effects are going to change the way in which the disease spreads through the population? How the disease is transmitted. Yeah, okay. So what form, how effective a contact do you need to get this disease? Yeah. How quickly, it, how quickly it mutates. Yep. Uh, how quickly it goes from infection to Yeah, so how long you're actually infective, whether, you know, luckily sort of things happen to ill people like they either get better or they, go to, or they get out of the room and they go home to bed or they die or something like that. And anyway, they stop being, they stop being infective. Okay, so the first stage in modelling this, okay, is the is the various parameters that we would consider. So the infectivity of the disease, um, how long you're infected for, and so on. So how could we model this semi-abstractly? Semi okay? How could we put this into something that we could sort of play with? Okay? And probably the oldest models, dating back to people like Polya, are simple urn models. So I, I, should, have got some, I should have got something more high-tech, but I just raided the tea bag store earlier, and we've got different type, different coloured balls in these bags, and we can pull them out, and this represents an, in, an interaction. So this could be an interaction where an ill, pe an Ill person meets a well person, and, and then we can work out sort of infection from that. And I would recommend, if you were teaching this, to actually get kids to play with something, you know, with, to play with something concrete, play with something physical, to sort of see a disease spreading in front of them. So they've got something concrete. Okay, but how... What, what's going to happen if we try and model it with a ball, sort of balls in bags kind of model? Okay. It's going to, you know, to model something realistically, we're going to have a bag with too many balls. Yeah? We're going to have things which are just too big to actually play with, things which take too much time. So the most natural thing is to move to some sort of computer simulation. So this is a very simple simulation, okay, which replicates that urn model. So I just pull out two people. Here I've picked out two well people. And nothing's, and nothing's happened. And kids can play with this, so we can put in more steps, and so we don't wait too long, I can, I can alter the speed. Okay? I can run a simulation, and we can watch this disease as it spreads through the population. Now as the number of ill people increases, it spreads quickest. When's it going to spread fastest of all? Okay. Why is it not going to be spreading fastest at the end? Because no one to kill. So towards the end, yeah, You've got very few well people, so most of the interactions are sick versus sick. Okay? So does anyone want to postulate what the graph of the infection is going to what the graph of the infection is going to look like? Yeah. Okay, so it's going to grow slowly to slowly to start with, then it's gonna then it's gonna be a period where it's growing fast, and then it's gonna tail off, tail off towards the end. Then of course over here we've got extra little sort of things that we can play with. We can introduce recovery. Okay, so we can introduce a, fact, uh, a sort of recovery function, and now when I start running my simulation, we can see that the green people start turning red where they're, where they're immune. Okay. okay, so we built a model, okay? And I think kids would naturally play with this model. Yeah? They can get outputs from this model that they can then look at and they can see, and see what happens. So here, the graph is going to look like 
uh, an increase in the number of immune people. Eventually, the infection might die out. Okay, next strand. Okay, we've got a model. Let's try and critique it. Are there any limitations in what we've done? What sort of factors have we, what sort of factors have we ignored? Getting sick twice. Getting sick twice. Okay, so I could have introduced a probability of losing immunity. That's this slider here. Okay, what I've also not considered is any spatial characteristics. Okay, so I could, the students could be encouraged to look at a different simulation here where an ill person infects some of their neighbours and you can get little funky things like running an animation and you can see the disease spreading um, spatially. Okay, modelling some sort of pandemic. You can attach this to news stories. You can attach this to things which people are interested in. Again, I think this is, I think this is building on what Joe... Joe mentioned earlier, it's the multi, you know, it's the, it's the dynamism, you know? Whenever we talk about sort of differential equations, if you pick a proper textbook on it, it talks about dynamics of differential equations. Maths is a really dynamic subject. And what kids, kids are really dynamic as well. They want to see stuff moving. They want to see stuff changing. And they can look at different descriptive elements. So here we've got a disease where people don't recover, and we get this similar graph to before. Here we've got a probability of recovery. Can anyone describe this graph to me qualitatively? What's, the, what's happened with this disease spread? Plateaus. So it plateaus. Okay, so there's some initial period at the start where we're losing well people, um, we're gaining ill people, but eventually the disease hits what sort of... What's, what would we say about if we look at from time 100 onwards? What, how would you describe... Yeah, it's just the disease has persisted within the population. Okay, so that's good words. That's good descriptive words, good sort of quantitative literacy. Okay, so it's persisted within the population. Is there much variation after 100 time steps? No, we've, we've, we've hit a sort of, how would we describe it as mathematicians? We've hit a sort of equilibrium. Okay, so like, you know, one of the things which I think is really important when people talk about maths and the uses of maths is being able to describe things, being able to describe qualitatively what's happened. You know, kids off the back of this module could go on the news and say, you know, this disease has got this sort of parameters and we would expect it to persist within the population for a long time at a stable level or something, or something similar. Okay, one of the things I said at the start is we're going to be like a CBM lesson. Okay, but in truth, it can't be like a CBM lesson because is a CBM lesson going to be de developed in the context of a lecture hall? Okay? No. Where would, I, where, would you, where would you naturally take this lesson next? So you've got lots of things that the children can play with. They can play with simulations. They can generate graphs with outputs. So they've got at their control disease. So what, they, what they're in a position to do is they're in a position to discuss amongst themselves, to have a certain freedom. What would I like to know? What would I like to know about how a disease is going to affect a population? What are interesting questions to ask? Okay, that's step one of what Conrad talks about, yeah? asking the right questions. And suddenly you've got a question there where kids are going to go in with an opinion. All too often with maths questions, kids go in without any opinion. They don't know if the answer is going to be four or six. They don't really care. But they might have an opinion on whether we should kill badgers. They might change that opinion if the maths points one way or the other. Okay? So they can ask, you know, important questions. I think this is an important question. Yeah? What proportion of the population must be immunized to curtail a disease? There's obviously lots of things, whooping cough, measles, topically, where we're losing a herd immunity because enough people aren't being immunized. Here, you could actually play with something. You could set an, a proportion of the population to be immune at the start, see how that affects the long-term um, see how that affects the long-term development of the disease. Okay, so really interesting questions, which you can just th throw the kids away with a sustained period of time to think about, to produce a report, to produce a report as they would in the city, as they would for if they had a job. You know, when you go for a job, your boss says to you, right, I want to know everything about whether we should kill badgers. You've got a week. Show me what you can tell me. Um, our math there's always this debate about what's in, what's out of the syllabus. 
So it's a nonsensical debate. Important tools will find their way in to what the students have to do. And in this, probability and distributions, these simple earn models that are so beloved of probabilists, they're going to find their way in, except that the kids are suddenly going to care about whether they pick out two balls of the same colour, as opposed to the way that earn models are at the moment, where they're just asked the question about balls. And the kid's natural response is, why is Abdul pulling two balls out of a bag? Um, what age group is this aimed at? Well, I would say that this lesson could be adapted to any age from about five upwards. I think that, I think that younger children, I think that year sevens, year fives, could just quite like the actual bright colours and watching things change, up to fitting with real data. Lots of real data is available. Which model best fits the data? Up to things like these little beasts, differential differential equations. And I think that when kids start playing around with these sliders and affect, and affect the differential equations, the fact that they've seen something come out from the, different, from the simulations, they're already thinking in the right way. Also, these interaction terms. Yeah? Why are we picking up ill people with a term that's proportional to i times s? Well, if they've done the calculations with the bags, if they've seen the curve, they know that the disease spreads fastest when there's a large number of ill people and a large number of susceptible people. These terms in the differential equations, they mean something. And too often when we do differential, differential equations with kids, for a kid it's a static process. It's a static process that they're trying to move around symbolically to get to an answer. To somebody who knows about differential equations, all the applied mathematicians in this room will know what this is, that this d by dt is a dynamic object. It's an exciting object. It's a rate of change. And I think from the, the simulations and the stuff that people play with, they will know that better from just having done it pushing symbols around. Now that gives a feel for what, the, what a CBM lesson could look like. Okay? But that's not the interesting part. That's not how it should be judged. We've heard a lot about evidence. The evidence should be what do students produce? What can students produce from this? And I think that's why the interesting people here, it's not me, but the students. So we're going to hear from Victoria, who came on the CBM course um, that I ran here over the summer. She's going to talk a little bit about how that ran. Then, and then I'll, I'll tell you about Marina in a bit. OK, so one of the first things that we looked at on the course as a sort of introduction was what is the best strategy in roulette? And this introduced us to some of the main programming te techniques in Wolfram Mathematica. So we started off by looking at a random simulation of if you were to bet one chip at a time, and we managed to program this, and we showed that in this particular example, if you started with tw 20 chips and you're trying to get to 100, we did lose. Um, we then were able to plot 100 games as a sort of graph, and we can see that here we do, in fact, lose them all, although we do get very close to one up there. However, we have lost them all. And then we looked at another strategy. So having looked at if you were betting one chip at a time, we looked to bet as many as you needed to win, or um, all of them, depending on whether you had more or less than a half. And we can see that from this graphic here, we do seem to win more often. We're winning three out of the seven times. And so although the games are short, we are winning more often. And this can then be shown by this cool graph, which shows that um, the amount below the fair is um, you've got a lot more chance of winning. And also, you can see from this graph, it looks kind of like a blancmange type fractal. And I thought that was really interesting because it shows that even if you start off doing something practical, you're never that far from beautiful maths, which was one of the things that Mr. Ficari wanted us to come away with. Um, so moving on to fractals, I come from quite a geeky family, I'm not going to lie. We're the sort of family where you go to an Italian restaurant, you've got the bread on the side, you've got the olive oil with the balsamic dressing in it, and then someone dips the bread and someone goes, oh, that looks like a Mandelbrot set. So, and I've also been, I, I, I'll put my hand up for this, I did once take pictures of broccoli because of its fractal properties. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get round to mapping the fractal mountains of Tibet in this course. However, I did look at mathematical generations of some fractals using Mathematica. So, Sierpinski's triangle is a fractal where you've got a triangle and then there's triangles within triangles within triangles. 
So I made this by firstly defining a triangle and then defining the function, which would involve finding the midpoint of the triangle and then making basically connecting lines. And then each level is the previous level with all the other things added together. So we're starting from our original triangle and then as it increases each level, I was very proud of this, um, you can see that it increases as, the, it, as each level is added and more triangles are produced. Um, another way that I looked at was using more pure math. So we looked at Pascal's triangle. So using the binomial function within Mathematica, I was able to create ones and zeros by um, basically dividing by two. And then I could create a triangle from this by colouring the ones and zeros in black and white and creating this into a graphic that so looked like this. And this didn't just work with purely um, dividing by two, this also worked with dividing by five, which I was quite proud of, and also all the other numbers. So that was another interesting thing to see how you can get beautiful maths from something that you start off thinking how's, well, to me, for someone who's only done maths at secondary school and had only just started my A-level, was thinking how's that relevant to anything in life? But you can see it does actually create beauty. And I don't know whether any of you have played the chaos game, where I've been bored in maths lessons, so I've played it many a time. You draw a polygon and define a starting point, and then from that starting point, you pick a vertice and find the midpoint of the line that you've created, and then you draw a dot there, and you do the same thing again. So using a random function in Mathematica, I was able to choose a polygon vertice randomly each time and use my previous points. And then from the list of points that I created, it again created Sierpinski's triangle. So as you can see, I saw quite a lot of triangles during that week of maths. Um, so I really enjoyed the computer-based mathematics summer school. And I'm just going to talk through what a few other people did, because not everyone is ob as obsessed as, uh, by triangles as I am. So um, a couple of people looked at the best strategy for risk. So risk is a game where you've basically got the world split into different territories and you're trying to take over the world um, by deploying battalions and then uh, attacking other countries and it, uh, the, role, uh, the role of the dice determines whether you win or lose the battle. So one person looked at uh, ways to identify the best neighbouring territories to attack on a simplified grid like one shown like that, whilst another looked at the probabilities associated with the conflict, and then between them, having combined all their, all their code and after much sort of pain and anguish at trying to get their variables to match, um, they were trying to determine the best initial deployment of battalion to optimise their winning uh, chances. And surprisingly enough, their initial results showed that an even split of troops was better than a concentration of troops, which is somewhat counter to what they thought when they first started playing it. And we did get to conclude the, get the week with a game of risk, so that was always good. Um, one person made a Warhammer calculator, um, which looked at the various pr probabilities associated with Warhammer. And it simulated the overall results from ba battle outcomes and uh, from battle, and you could input various different things. And what, the project that um, inspired me the most, because then I went on to do some more research, yes, I'm geeky enough to go on a summer school, learn some things, and then go off and then do some more research of other things that other people have learned. So um, they looked at slime molds as part of their extended project. So, and they wanted to know, are slime mold networks random or predetermined? So they had made exactly the same setup in Petri dishes of a slime mold in the middle and then oat flakes surrounding it in exactly the same positions. And they'd taken photos and then they'd overlaid the images in Mathematica. And using colours, they were able to find a quantitative way to measure the difference um, of the variability of the networks and to determine whether it was random or like predetermined. Um, so then I did some more research and I came across what someone from Hokkaido University in Japan had done. They had a Petri dish with oat flakes arranged in, uh, as major cities in Tokyo. Then they used light to simulate, because um, mold doesn't like the light, they used that to simulate water, mountains, and obstacles. And then they started the slime mold off in Tokyo and let, just let it grow. And you can see that the mold network that was created is actually very similar to the actual Tokyo rail network, which I thought was really interesting. Anyway, coming off of that point, Oh, and it's kind of fractal-like as well, so it's all, it's all relating back. This presentation works. Um, so basically, from this summer school, I learned that everything 
is related to everything, if you think about it. Maths is everywhere, not just what you learn at school. It's not the same thing where you just goes on and on. You don't really know what's going on necessarily. But um, th and there's lots of interesting ways to explore that, and I think that's what Mathematica helped me do. Thank you very much. Um, we're just going to just going to put on Marina's presentation, but I think just a sort of like Jeez. side point here. Uh, there's so much debate, and if ever you go to sort of tedious conferences as a teacher, all the discussion is, what should we teach the kids, and when? When should we introduce logarithms? Should we do this in year 10? Should we do this in year 12? And the question, and what you see here, is, it's just where should you let the kids go? You know, I did not know at the start of this week what the children would be interested in. You know, I thought they'd look at roulette and they'd think, oh, wow, yeah, this is a good strategy. I wonder if I can, you know, sort of beat, you know, sort of count cards and by the end of the week beat casinos. I didn't know I was going to have a nerd who was going to look at the fractal and think, oh, I'm going to go into fractals. Okay? But there's a, certain degree of, there's a certain degree of freedom. Anyway, um, I think Marina's all set up. So this is a slightly different perspective. Um, so Marina is studying maths at school, she would explain. Okay? But she's from, well, I'll let her, I'll let her talk for herself. So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vaccaro. Uh, my name is Marina Palm, and I'm uh, currently uh, in Seven Oaks, and I'm studying math at high level in my final year now, and I'm doing the IB, and I have Mr. Vakar as my math teacher. I think the most important thing about me today is that um, I do not want to be a mathematician, but I actually do want to be an economist, and therefore I see math in a in a different way. Um, and I'm perfectly happy for kind of Mathematica to do the hard work for me, and I'm happy to accept that um, I can identify the method um, that I have to use in order to get my results and then kind of go on from there. So, for example, I've, I've got this um, integration question, and I'm perfectly happy to accept that the answer is pi over 4, and I, I can then go on and, f um, and do further work with it. Um, so there are a couple of things that I do like about math lessons and that, that I do not like about math lessons. Um, I think the most important um, things, uh, thing is that um, they're often irrelevant and really made up questions. So we kind of had this um, question in, in math, and I think Mr. McCarr should leave the room now, but um, we had a sample of uh, 10 sheep and we were asked to uh, find the mean and the standard deviation. And I got an answer of about 350 kilograms as a mean. And I think questions like these are just pointless because I, don't, I didn't get anything out of it. I knew that the mean was 350 kilograms, which, is, which can't be right anyways because sheep cannot weigh 350 kilograms. But also it didn't, it didn't get me anywhere. And I, it just, I, I just didn't get uh, anything out of it. And there was no real application to the real world. And also, what I sometimes see with uh, math questions, especially in exams, is that um, the focus is really on the calculation, how you, if you're doing the calculations right, that you get the plus and the minus signs right. And I think it should be much more on the method. So on the kind of identifying what method, um, what method you have to use. Is it a geometrical distribution, or is it um, a binomial distribution? Um, and I think that's, that's, that's more important than actually doing the, the, you know, the real calculation. What I do like about math lessons is that um, we were actually given the task to make up our own questions. And I, and I took some inflation rates um, from uh, the UK over the past 10 years. And I um, designed a question where the students were asked to find the standard deviation and the mean. And I think um, questions like these are, are really relevant to the real world. And I think I really got something out of it. And, I, and I just, it just made sense to me. And I could see that the mean actually means um, that the target rate was kind of like 2% or whatever. Um, I was also asked to do a written assignment, a portfolio um, for my math high level course where um, about shadow function. And the main method about shadow function is basically um, a shadow function is basically a reflection of a polynomial by a shadow generating function, so the red dotted line, um, to find the complex roots but graphically. And um, I did a, this is a cubic polynomial and uh, with three variables. So by varying the variables, I could see, I could easily read off the graph. Um, I could see the, the real roots and then here the two complex roots uh, graphically. 
Um, and then I could change um, the variables. So for example, minus three and maybe just one. And here, 1.8. Um, and so I had my cubic uh, polynomial and I could easily just find the complex roots. And what I really liked about this task is that it, it was that it was kind of open-ended. So I went on um, to do higher order polynomials and I kind of, I ended up getting really into it. And it was also the first time that I actually used Mathematica. And I think it was, like, it was at the beginning, um, it was hard um, manipulating graphs, establishing graphs. But I think it was, a re a really, it was really a life skill that I kind of got out of it. And I, now I'm going to be able to um, use graphs for, for all my life if Mathematica still exists then, which I'm sure it will. Um, and also, the most important thing um, for me was that it kind of the solution made sense because it was graphically shown and I could see that the solutions are here rather than if we just have a quick look at my actual portfolio. Um, I, I used, I had, I had to prove loads of things and um, I ended up um, on my, kind of being at 4 a.m. on my fourth page or fifth page of trying to do a proof and I had to do it for the fifth time because I got a minus sign wrong and it just wouldn't give me the right answer but I knew what I was doing and I knew the method was right but I just um, uh, didn't, didn't get it right. And so I think for me kind of doing all these proofs didn't get, didn't really get me anywhere but then um, sh looking at it graphically um, uh, the solution or the method really made sense to me and kind of seeing the, the transformations in order to get to the shadow function. Um, so these were the really good things. And then um, what, I, what I didn't really like about this task was that the details, as I said, were really hard. And um, also uh, shadow functions in itself is kind of a pointless method because there are better ways to solve a polynomial just using factorizing or just um, typing it to Mathematica solve and I get the complex conjugate pairs and the real root just here. So I think um, math should be more about um, one, the method, so just identifying the method in a question. It's a bit like the IB um, because the focus is really that you're using the right distribution or whatever and then if you, if you do get a minus uh, or, or plus sign wrong um, you'll still get most of the points. And then to I think um, nowadays some questions are really, really abstract. And I think uh, if you would design questions that have an application to the real world, more people would be interested in math because I think only about 2% um, like Victoria are going to actually want to be real mathematicians. And I think 98% like me um, just need math um, for, for other subjects. Thank you. Um, I've just got a few other examples that I want to share, but just before we get this slide away, I just I think in case anyone's sort of not got this point between the difference between computer assisted and computer based, I think this is an ideal point, an ideal time to make it. Is that I think traditionally when people have looked at impl implementations of technology, they would justify the technology of whether it would improve the traditional skill. And in this example, I'm not at all arguing that that's the case. I don't think that off the back of having done this project, that Marina is more likely to calculate a standard deviation correctly, to more, right, more likely to remember where to put the square root. Is it n over n minus 1, or is it n minus 1 over n, and, and details like that. Okay? That's not what computer-based maths is going to achieve. But what I'm completely convinced of is that if I said to Marina that the standard deviation of income in the UK is $12,000, that she would know what that means, that she would have a feel for what a standard deviation was. So it's not necessary that this is going to drive up s traditional skills, but what it will do is it will give that qualitative understanding, what does an answer mean? We very rarely have part E of a maths question which, you know, part C is find the value of x, and the answer is x equals 4. That's what I always tell my students. If you don't know, just put x equals 4. But what we very rarely have is we very rarely have part F of the question, which says, who cares? Why is it an interesting fact that the answer is 4? What does it being 4 tell you that it being 2 doesn't? 
Okay, so anyway, I've got a few more examples to go. So these are a few other examples of student examples. I just want to show you that this is, is not just a one-off. And I think teaching the IB, the extended essay is the most fantastic part of it because basically the students have got the freedom to pick a subject which interests them. And I think the elective element is really important. Marina, Marina's right. When she makes up questions, she does it about interest rates. The other people in the class, when there's questions about making up examples for statistics, they're always, you know, Dash drank seven pints last night, four pints the night before, calculate the mean and stuff like that. But it at least means stuff to them. Um, and let's have a look at some extended essays. So we've got uh, Chris Ying, who's a student at um, Seven Oaks. He's a drummer. And he was interested in... Um, harmonics on, the, on a drum skin. Okay? And just to show how easy it is to get to students doing sensible mathematics that means something to them. He looked up at, on Wikipedia the wave equ equation on a membrane, and the solution is freely available. This is a solvable um, differential equation. And he was able to get, get that solution and look at the different modes. So this is the principal mode of a drum vibrating as you'd expect it to but then you've also got the radial and the angular harmonics, okay, up to something quite complicated. What are the technical difficulties in implementing that? Very little. That's the code, and essentially that's the only interesting part of the code. The rest of it is just graphic directive, so it looks, so it looks relatively nice. And I've got examples of students' work to show that they go beyond doing this. He was able to play the sounds. He was able to look at, calculate the Fourier series. And his extended essay explained why a drum is unpitched in a way that a guitar string is pitched, because you don't just have um, multiples of the principal frequency. Something which I think is cool. Um, so Matthew Matro is another of my students, looked at Lagrange points in orbits. Again, he went much further. But this is something which I think is beautiful. I think this is one of the big sort of human stories is the discovery of, you know, Newton's discovery of orbits. And here's, the diff here's Newton's famous equation. This is, the f this is the equation of force. It's an inverse square law attractor. And there's the differential equation in a recognizable form. Yeah. The acceleration is just the position divided by the radius cubed. And we get an elliptical orbit. And I think what a student is able to be put into He's able to be put into the position of Kepler, of Newton, of Brahe, and the people that gathered the data, looked at the outcome, look at the orbit. You know, and if you take this away, what is the planet going around the sun doing? And they maybe sort of, they would describe it qualitatively. It's a, it's a curve. It's slower when it's further away from the sun. Going back to what Joe said, it's the multiple, it's the dynamics, it's the seeing it. If you try and teach people Everyone in this room, I imagine, has been taught sort of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Can you remember them? It's something like vaguely about angular momentum. Kids exposed to this on a daily basis, I think, will come away with a, a memory of the planet speeding up as it gets closer to the sun. This is a current example. This is someone who wants to work in the city, like lots of people do. He looked at black shoal hedging pricing. But I just want to finish with my favorite piece of student work that any student of mine has ever ever produced and it was it's not particularly great mathematically but it was just the experience of putting it together which was great he was a very interesting student and he decided that he wanted to do his extended essay um, in mathematics and I said okay what do you want to do it on he said oh, I'd quite like to do financial maths I said fine okay I know a little bit of financial maths um, how about we look at the black shoals equation nah I said why not I don't want to do that I said, why don't you want to do that? He said, ah, it's been done before. And I said, OK, let's look at something a little bit more advanced. Let's look at volatility hedging. Mm, nah, why, why don't you want to do that? Ah, it's been done before. And I just said to him, I said, look, Ilya, you know, putting on my kind of pompous teacher act, I said, look, you know, you're 17 years old, OK? You want to find a problem that is, A, interesting, B, that's never been done before, and C, that you can solve. You know, how likely do you think that is? And he sort of looked at me a bit aggressively, the way that Russians do, and he went away, and he came back, he came back the next day, and he sort of said, oh, Mr. Vakar, have you ever heard of a Ponzi scheme? 
And I sort of said, oh, it's vaguely, I know it's a bit like a pyramid scheme. He said, it's not like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> and I sort of said, OK. And he said, has that been looked at before? And we went, on, we went on Google, we went on Wikipedia, couldn't find any primary literature. And he said, OK, I'm going to do that. OK. And he built, wrote down a set of differential equations, modelling how, how it would evolve. Now, I'm not making any claims this is going to change the world and this is going to prevent any future mad-offs, you know, or that these are the right differential equations. There's quite glaring assumptions in what he did, but the differential equations, when you think about them, are perfectly, are perfectly natural. So he's got uh, in a nominal amount, that that's the amount of money that everybody thinks they've got, and that's growing at some interest rate. There's then new money genuinely coming into the scheme, so that's this term. And then what we've got here is the amount of money in the Ponzi fund, which is two parts, which is a proportion of the new money that's being invested coming in. So this is new investors putting money in, and then uh, money coming out of the Ponzi scheme, which is people banking some of their dividends. So people getting a dividend from the Ponzi scheme, banking part of it, and that's the, and that's the bank term. And he made some... He made some assumptions about how much they would invest, and he got a very simple set of equations, and he was able to play around with the um, various parameters. So this is the advertised interest rate, so this is how much the scheme promised. This is the growth of the scheme, so this is how much new money comes into the scheme, and this is the perceived rate of failure. So this is how likely investors were to put all their life savings into it. So the, the lower you put this, if you put it too low, it complains. Um, the lower you put this, everyone thinks it's a good scheme and they're investing everything. So the amount of money in the Ponzi scheme and the amount of money that's actually there, the, the red and the blue curve, follow each other exactly. And he was able to just show nice little things like if you have an advertised interest rate that's too high, the scheme grows for a time and then quite dramatically collapses. And of course, the interesting part is the evaluation, yeah? the, dr the drama of the collapse. You know, it's not that it suddenly gets a little bit dodgy and then goes. It goes completely. Um, what's the? I'm trying to think of the polite version of the phrase. Goes completely up, um, pretty much, pretty much overnight. Okay, and it's, it was a really good piece of work. And for me, it was, it was the embodiment of this four-step approach. It was a student looking around. What am I interested in? Okay, finding a question. It wasn't me. You know, we're very used to setting questions. Then he built a model, you know, albeit, albeit simplistic. This isn't going to be, you know, he's not going to win the Nobel Prize for economics. Does the calculations with the computer taking the strain. And then he's got something which he can evaluate, which he can remember, which he can explain to people that he's done and, and get something tangible and get something really tangible out of it. So what are the conclusions? Um, so the teaching style, if we go back to the early things with the simulations, is experimental. Maths is an experimental subject. You play with things, you look at what the effect is. Very similar to Joe's Excel spreadsheet earlier, although it would have been better in Mathematica. Um, <laughs> that, the, that the output is to promote a mathematical literacy. Okay? To introduce these things, like when we see kind of um, getting equilibria, to use that phrase. The disease, you know, the disease persists with equilibrium. So you look at the solution, you say, what does that solution tell me? So you end up with a model for disease spread that you understand. And what would you actually gain from solving those set of differential equations, you know, by getting complicated? I'm not even sure off the top of my head whether they're solvable. But what do you gain from doing a horrible integral? You gain from having those, having those graphs that you can manipulate. Um, it encourages evaluation and reflection, you know, the constant question is, at the end, what do these results mean? Should there be a fat tax? Are we all going to die of swine flu? Okay, now, obviously, some people are less interested in that, but I don't think that um, the people like Victoria are going to be disenfranchised. I always say with the beauty of mathematics, you can run, but you can't hide. You know, you, no matter how banal and worldly the problem looks like, you're going to find beautiful maths in it. Um, and you're going to get people, you know, Who's, who, who don't work in the city because they, they're, they're much more interested in looking at blancmange-shaped fractals rather than using it to make millions as a, as a city trader. And the final point, which I really want to get across, is that I think that this is something which is for all ages. 
The, the question remains the same, am I going to get ill? All that differs is the level of sophistication. So the task from year to year is not in year seven you learn logarithms. The task is in year seven you get asked, how is this process going to evolve? In year eight you get asked it, in year nine. All that changes is the sophistication of the, te of the techniques that the sophistication of the techniques that you use. We're used to this in other subjects. We're used in, in other subjects. You start in year seven by reading Harry Potter and commenting on it, and then you just all that changes is the novel <laughs> and, and the appreciation of style. You don't, there's not a fundamental different skills. You don't say, oh, we're not going to teach rhyme until year 11. Or we're not going to teach, we can't teach you alliteration now in, because you're only year nine. That's a year 13 concept. You know, so the differentiation, you know, not mathematical differentiation, differentiation of abilities, is done not by the setting them different tasks. You have to have set eight where they're asked easy questions. They're all asked to play with the model of people getting ill, but they've got the freedom of sticking to something quite simplistic, maybe even just doing the calculations associated with the earn model, but there's nothing to stop a younger child going on Wikipedia, going on Wolfram Alpha, using all the knowledge apps that are out there, and getting to stuff which is, which is advanced and meaningful. Okay? And as I say, you can't have a CBM lesson here, because a CBM lesson is definitely not a lecture. You know, and if this was a lesson, you'd be all on your laptops, and you'd be playing with things, and you'd be going, oh, look at this, isn't this cool? And of course, obviously, most, anyway, everyone's talked too long, so I'm going I'm to I'm stop now as well. Thank you very much.